Hi everyone, Dr. Kelvis here to talk to you about Alzheimer's disease. And just disclaimer, this is just medical information. This is not formal medical advice. If you do exhibit any of these symptoms, it's very important that you, you seek medical help. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease is one of the leading causes of dementia currently in, in the world, with one in five women and one in 10 men having a lifetime risk. It is a degenerative process in the brain that leads to gradual loss of memory and judgment. And with time, the person is no longer able to function. Um, death usually results typically from malnutrition or opportunistic infections. They may get a little touch of pneumonia that unfortunately just gets out of control or um, they may usually die from like general body wasting because the kind of the drive in the brain that controls hunger doesn't work properly or um, maybe they're not just getting enough help at home and, and they're not able to cook and provide for themselves. So for the most part, uh, patients develop Alzheimer's over the age of, of 65, but it can also present as early onset. And we're now that we have better systems to study Alzheimer's and, and things, we're, we're seeing more and more of these early onset cases. So I don't know if it's accurate to say that the incidence of early onset Alzheimer's is increasing. I think it's just that we have better symptoms to actually identify it and, and diagnose it. So I don't wanna say that Alzheimer's is, is increasing. That's it's incorrect. Uh, so while highly heritable, which means it is genetic, it can be passed down from generations, there are a ton of sporadic cases of Alzheimer's disease. And then from those sporadic cases, it begins a pedigree of future family cases. Thankfully, scientific research has you know, developed the technology necessary to study the responsible genes and thus illuminate you know, the pathogenesis of why and how symptoms unfold. So genetic testing is absolutely recommended for you if a family contains a significant history, which means it's three or more affected of either late onset or early onset Alzheimer's. Um, late onset AD is, is considered, it's in the acronym in the medical community is LOAD, so late onset Alzheimer's disease. If you ever see that like on a receipt or a chart. Um, the most commonly tested genes are, and I'm sure anybody that's ever done any research on Alzheimer, you're, you're very well familiar with this uh, term, the amyloid precursor protein. And this is the protein that tends to just accumulate in and around the neurons and clogs them up eventually results in neuronal death. Uh, there's actually been a new medication that's come out to, to treat Alzheimer's, and I'm not gonna get into that here, but just to emphasize, like with all of this fantastic research that's coming now, we very quickly may have some sort of treatment or cure for, for Alzheimer's. Uh, so most commonly tested genes, like I said, are the amyloid precursor protein, prencinolin one and two, uh, trisomy 21, so if, if a patient is mentally handicapped, they are uh, at very high risk of developing Alzheimer's. And then also apolipoprotein E. So again, these are just kind of the most, in, most commonly tested genes. There are other genes. They're still being studied. Same with any other neurologic disorder. Uh, at the time of this recording, these are the biggest ones. But you know, tomorrow there, there could be like a big new discovery and there's like three new genes that are on the market or on the scene. And, um, okay, so again, to, to kind of reiterate, there's a really important distinction when looking at genes or alleles and how they're transferred. Are they autosomal dominant or are they autosomal recessive? And autosomal dominant means that very high risk these genes will be transferred down to you from your parents and you will absolutely develop symptoms. And unfortunately with Alzheimer's, it is pretty autosomal dominant with almost complete penetrance. So penetrance is a really fancy genetic term just to mean, um, and it's a percentage, right? So is it 100% uh, penetrance or 10% penetrance? It just kind of tells you the, the level of symptoms that, that you'll get based on what your parents had. So just to, again, reiterate, Alzheimer's is, is pretty autosomal dominant with almost complete 100% penetrance. So if one of your parents has had uh, Alzheimer's, you're we're um, we're almost 100 percent confident that you will too with the same severity uh but we can't say you, you know okay your parents had late onset then you will also have late onset or if your parents were early onset you'll be early onset that 
that we're still trying to tease out. We need, we need more research with that. So let's see. Recent studies show that when comparing tissue samples uh, between, you know, normal non-dementia brains to those with monogenetic causes of Alzheimer's disease, um, and, and I'm going to get into some medical jargon here, but I promise I'm going to I'm, I'm going to break it down for you. So again, we're comparing Alzheimer's disease from genetic causes and normal brain tissue, and in Alzheimer neuron tissue, brain tissue, we've seen a significant decrease in mRNA levels within the, the nucleus of the neuron, within other surrounding inflammatory cells that help to kind of keep the brain clean, like glial cells. Um, and, and what this means is that there's markedly less activity at the molecular level within Alzheimer neurons and the cells that clean up the debris. Uh, over time, this results in widespread neuronal death, which explains the progressive memory loss and overt personality shift that, that we see in Alzheimer patients. So studies showed that the same decrease in mRNA production or showed the same decrease in, in molecular activity between excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And so quick review, there are some neurons that make the brain or make actions, you know, up and go. It helps our muscles move. And then there's inhibitory neurons, which help, you know, again, it's kind of self-explanatory, but to help stop uh, movement or stop brain processes or thoughts. So we're seeing widespread decrease at the molecular level in activity in excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And this is extremely important for a lot of reasons. Um, so the concentrations of astrocytes and oligodendrocytes remain about the same between the two different uh, brain tissue samples. So oligodendrocytes and astrocytes are, again, just other kind of inflammatory cells. They help kind of keep the brain clean and, and um, I, I guess, disease-free. Same with glial cells. So we've seen a significant decrease in glial cells, but astrocytes and oligodendrocytes, those concentrations stay about the same. Uh, we did see in, in looking at these two tissue samples, what the study, the published study showed, um, a significant reduction in interneurons though. And this is extremely important uh, scientific discovery because this explains why so many patients with end-stage Alzheimer's disease develop significant epilepsy. It's these interneurons that kind of help inhibit some of the, the signals going through different neurons. And, and that's, that's kind of the definition of epso, epso, eps, excuse me, epilepsy, right? It's when we just have kind of uncontrolled firing of neurons. Interneurons are kind of that, obviously they're self-explanatory, that inter-P, that in-between neuron piece that helps inhibit seizures. Um, Let's see, so in pre- and postsynaptic proteins and receptors, uh, we saw those are notably down-regulated. So um, neurons are kind of like a highway, right? And we've got signals coming into a neuron and then signals going out of the neuron, and there's receptors on both ends. We're noticing that those receptors are markedly down-regulated in Alzheimer's disease. And so that just explains, again, the, the memory and, and the inability to function neurons are just not able to communicate to each other anymore. So the paper was honestly so brilliant. Uh, and these findings clearly illustrate that neurons with monogenetic changes steadily stop producing and metabolizing. They shut down and in a sense until they slowly die. And that explains kind of the gradual progression of Alzheimer's. Um, monogenetic Alzheimer disease neurons, they showed higher levels of inflammation and oxidative stress but in a totally unique way. And we, in, in the study, compared these to uh, other types of inflammation in the brain, like say after a patient has had a stroke, the inflammation pattern was totally different from like those who had a stroke. So this is, this is a very unique uh, inflammation pattern that, that we're seeing in Alzheimer's disease neurons. Um, so monogenetic Alzheimer neurons they showed less ability to communicate with other neurons, like I said, but increased communication with certain inflammatory cells like astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. So the neurons 
that they are aware and cognizant that they are under some sort of stress and that they need help. They're not able to communicate with glial cells, but they can communicate with other types of inflammatory cells. Um, what scientists, I actually read a paper, a scientist was quoted saying that at the intracellular level, you know, the reprogramming within these uh, monogenetic Alzheimer disease neurons, it's, it's almost exactly similar to the reprogramming that goes on within a cancer cell. So um, the way that a, a cell kind of turns cancerous is certain checkpoints get kind of turned off, right? So cells are metabolizing, they're using energy, they're reproducing, but there's checks and balances, right? So that they don't just uh, reproduce and, and, and divide at an exponential rate. If, uh, if those checkpoints get turned off, then you do develop cancer. What the, what the scientist in the paper was trying to say is the way the intracellular reprogramming has happened due to genetic causes within Alzheimer neurons, it's almost exactly, it's almost in the same way as, as those checkpoints get turned off in cancer. Um, I'm not saying that Alzheimer patients develop cancer in their brain. That's not at all what I'm saying. It's just that it's, it's very similar. And that's a very key important finding because we're still trying to understand at the molecular level what is going on. So, uh, and what we found is that these changes are widespread across all neurons within the brain. So uh, for example, in like Parkinson disease, you know, the big problem is within the substantia nigra and the neurons that make dopamine, whereas Alzheimer, we're seeing these degenerative changes in all neurons in the brain, all areas. Um, so it, it does kind of explain the slow long-term progression of Alzheimer and it suggests that the disease process begins a long, long time before patients actually develop symptoms. And, and so these findings support the hypothesis that treatment needs to begin decades before symptom onset, decades. Uh, in general, the, the medical community has viewed research of monogenetic neurological disorders pessimistically due to the overwhelming disease burden and limited treatment options. Uh, diseases like Alzheimer and Parkinson's, they've always been labeled as incurable and, and terminal. And so it's, it's an understatement to say that making any change to this long held dogma in, in the general medical community will be very difficult. Uh, advances in DNA sequencing technology have made it so much easier to diagnose monogenetic neurological disorders. Um, and we need more long-term studies that, that follow families to glean amounts of data and potential, you know, potentially shed light on the specific symptoms behind each genetic mutation. So for example, if a father develops Alzheimer at 60 disease, we need to test and start studying his 30 year old son. What we may find is that he's already got those small molecular changes that are starting to happen. Well, what if we could develop some sort of treatment for him and start him at 30 years old and actually, for lack of a better term, cure him? Uh, so knowledge is power. Um, it is highly, highly encouraged and recommended that if you do have a family history of Alzheimer that you do get tested. Um, again, there is kind of the, the psychological ethical dilemma with getting genetically tested, uh, the, the psychological burden of knowing, of knowing, okay, in 10, 20 years, I will develop Alzheimer's. Is this something that you really want to know? So sleep on it. Think about that. Talk with your family. You can also just have your physician test you and, and then your physician doesn't necessarily have to tell you. I, I had a lot of patients ask me or request really that they would rather not know. They want to proceed with treatment and let me do my thing, but they don't want to carry that anxiety provoking burden of, okay, I, I will develop this disease and hopefully in 30 years we have a cure. I'm, I'm pretty confident we will. But so that's just something to consider and think about before you get any genetic testing. Um, so Again, knowledge is power. Let's let's get people genetically tested. Let's accumulate the data and, and let's get let's get more cures out there. Let's catch patients sooner.